A very simple but successful way of investing is to put your money into equity, leave it for decades and then ride the drift upwards in equity prices and usually you come out with a fairly good outcome at the end of it. But that doesn't always work. And in this video we're going to look at the case of the equity bubble in Japan which is one example where it didn't work. And in fact markets in Japan still haven't recovered from the bubble which they inflated for political reasons decades ago. Now if you do want to learn more about investing a great way to do that is as part of our Patreon community. If you do you get access to all sorts of videos, explainers which only you will have access to as a Patreon member and you also get access to the chat application Slack so you can ask questions of me and other members of the community. If you do want to learn more about that there's a link in the description and there should be a link next to me. So now let's look at the case of the Japanese equity bubble in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances seek independent financial advice. So let's start off looking at the idea that stocks only go up. This is a graph I often show which is the S&P 500 index of US equity going all the way back to the early 1960s. And although it does have some ups and downs as crises come and go the general drift is upwards. And in fact to show this graph I had to put it on a logarithmic chart otherwise you'd see that the graph just goes up exponentially. And if you buy a global index your returns will look something like this graph. It will go up exponentially over time with some big crises on the way. But if you buy single countries or single stocks even it often looks like this. And this is a graph of the Topics Index which is a Japanese equity index going back to before 1960. The graph starts off looking very much like that S&P graph going up exponentially. And in fact it accelerates during this period between 1986 and 1991. But then something quite shocking happens which is that the long term trend completely reverses. And in fact the latest value of the Topics Index is well below the value it had at the end of this bubble period in the early 1990s. So in this video we're going to look at the reasons for that and the lessons that it might teach us about the bubble that we're currently seeing in some equity markets. And in case you think Japan is a special case it certainly isn't. There are several countries which really haven't had good equity returns over the last decade and a half. So if we go back to 2008 and scale our indices, our equity indices, so they're all equal to 100 in 2008 we can track the value of those indices through time. And beneath me here you can see that the value of all of those indices are below their value in 2008. So for example Italy's FTSE MIB index would only be worth 68, the Spanish IBEX index would be worth 64, an emerging LATAM index 56, the Portuguese PSI index 43 and the FTSE Greece index denominated in sterling would it only be worth four. So make no mistake it is risky investing in single countries and you could end up with a bad outcome if something goes wrong in that country. And that's why usually it's best to diversify globally and a single global equity tracker will usually do fairly well because it irons out these idiosyncratic risks for individual countries. So let's start with our story about Japan. Here's a picture of Tokyo taken in 1946 and you can probably see at the top of the image here there's a huge amount of bombing damage. And if we looked at countries in Europe it was a similar situation. A great deal of infrastructure had been destroyed during the Second World War. And in the case of Japan America was very keen to help Japan reconstruct. That's because it wasn't a communist country and America was concerned about communism spreading in the Far East. And Japan's strategy for reconstruction was very successful which was to become very good at manufacturing and to export the manufactured goods that it produced all over the world. And here you can see some of the fruits of that policy which are Toyota cars. And this is the Toyota Museum in the United States. This top panel shows you US GDP growth so that's economic growth year by year and this data goes back for over a century. And in this bottom panel you can see growth for Japan. Now the effect of the second world war for Japan was clearly pretty catastrophic in terms of growth. So you can see this very severe two year recession here but then during this reconstruction period there were many years and each of these black dots is one year when growth was extremely strong. So you can see it roughly averaged about 10% growth growth for over a decade. And that was considerably better than growth in the US 
over the same period of time. So for Japan, these post-war reconstruction years were incredible, and it went very quickly from being almost an emerging market to one of the largest developed market economies in the world. Now the catalyst that inflated the equity bubble in Japan was a political one, and it starts off with an international agreement with the United States called the Plaza Accord. So in this top panel here, you can see the strength of the US dollar versus a basket of its trade partners. Now what was a real problem for the US was this very rapid increase in the strength of the dollar in the first half of the 1980s. The reason why that was a problem was that a very strong dollar made US goods and services very expensive when it came to export those abroad. And the dollar was strengthening because interest rates were so high to try and combat inflation, which had got out of hand. So the US entered an agreement with its largest trade partners, including Japan, to devalue the dollar versus their currencies. Now remember, countries like Germany and Japan depend on exports for their livelihood. So this can't have been an easy decision for them, because a stronger currency meant that their exports would become less competitive. But in the case of Japan, this allowed them to push forward some reforms, which they'd been planning to do anyway. But you can see that this agreement was very successful, and in fact the dollar did weaken very rapidly. After these incredibly successful decades of growth, Japan didn't want to put an end to that success story. So in order to combat the potential drag on growth, it introduced all sorts of policies which were designed to stimulate the economy. Financial markets after the Second World War in Japan were very strictly regulated, so they decided to loosen those regulations in order to allow economic growth to pick up. They also liberalized financial markets, so for example capital controls were lifted so Japanese people could invest internationally. And then at the bottom there you can see that there were many banking laws which were restricting the use of credit. And in order to stimulate growth, the Japanese government was very keen for banks to provide more credit for the housing market but also for consumer credit, with the idea being that they'd move away from being such an export-driven economy to one where domestic services drove more of their growth. And then finally they decided to lower interest rates in order to stimulate the economy and to counteract this shock from having their currency strengthen. So almost all of these decisions were political in nature and designed to counteract the effect of the Plaza Accord. Unfortunately, some of this deregulation and change in the laws led to their own problems. One of those problems was to do with the creation of something called a tokin. Now one way to think of this is like a hedge fund, a speculative investment company embedded inside every Japanese company. So for example, a car company like Toshiba could have internally a fund which would invest in speculative stocks. And in fact, the tax treatment of these speculative funds was easier than the tax treatment for long-term funds. So in a sense, the tax law was encouraging speculation and the creation of these investment vehicles inside companies. And the uptake of these token funds was quite dramatic. So in 1983, only 2 trillion yen was invested in them. But in the space of four years, that had increased 15-fold to 30 trillion yen invested in speculative Japanese companies. And if the idea of a speculative hedge fund embedded in a car company seems strange, you only have to look at Tesla's investment in Bitcoin to see an analogy in the present day. And of course, Tesla's not alone. A company called MicroStrategy has also invested heavily in Bitcoin, even though that has nothing to do with its core business. And in fact, it's just raised another billion for another speculative investment in Bitcoin. Another problem that surfaced, not on the way up during the bubble, but certainly on the way down, was a Japanese concept called kairetsu. The idea here is that one company buys the shares of another company, and that company buys the shares of the first company. So that means that many businesses are locked together by these interdependent shareholdings. And that can either happen horizontally across different business groups, which means that one company, say a car company, would buy shares in other car companies, or it can occur vertically, which means that one company could buy all of the companies in its supply chain. And this graph maps across shareholdings between many different Japanese companies. And I've just highlighted this link here between Bulldog Source and Topan Printing. And you have to ask yourself, why would a company that manufactures vegetable and fruit source buy the shares of a printing company? Now, of course, if those shares go up in value, it's going to look good for the company. But when an entire equity market falls, this interdependency can start to be a problem because there's really nowhere to hide. 
If one company's shares go down, so will the balance sheet value of all the companies which have bought shares in that company. Another problem was to do with the linkage between the creation of credit, that's loans, and land prices. So let's say we've got someone from a company who wants to borrow some money, and they're going to borrow that from a bank. To make the loan safer, the bank might ask for some collateral. That way, if the borrower can't repay the money, the bank can repossess the collateral and sell it. So in the case that the borrower can't repay, it reduces the bank's loss. So in many cases, companies would use land as collateral. And again, if land prices went up, that wasn't a problem. The value of the collateral would increase, the bank could lend more money as a result, but indirectly, the creation of credit, which stimulates the economy, was linked to the value of land. Now, during the late 1980s, when share markets were just going vertical in Japan, obviously a lot of retail investors, that's normal investors like you and I, got in on the action. And if we look at the percentage of trading volume, which was from personal investors, so that's this line in the middle here, that made up about a third of all trading. But you can see that by the time the bubble had popped in Japan by 1991, there was a gradual loss of interest by personal investors, and the trading volume fell to half of that value by 1997. And the combination of companies like Robin Hood, who make it very easy to trade and very cheap to trade, combined with the pandemic and people with disposable income and time on their hands, has created a massive influx of money into the equity market. So if we look at how much retail money is flooding into the equity market, the daily inflow is about $30 billion. Whereas before the pandemic, it was about a tenth of that value, around $3 billion a day. But if we do see a large correction in the equity market, it may be that that retail interest in equity markets starts to fade, just as it did in Japan. So now let's look at the timeline of what happened during the build-up and the popping of this bubble. A large part of the narrative about markets today and about inflation is that if you have a combination of fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus, so the government is spending more and the banks are keeping interest rates low, that should lead to a huge spike in inflation. But in fact, the situation was very similar in Japan in the late 80s. Whereas the US and Germany had a negative fiscal balance, Japan was borrowing in the bond market in order to spend more than it raised in taxes. And of course it was doing that to counteract the effect of the Plaza Accord and strengthening of its currency. And this is the central bank policy rate, which you can see was very high in 1980. It was above 12%. But it's not a coincidence that during this bubble period, interest rates were being cut very sharply by the Bank of Japan. And in this bottom panel, we can also see the increase in the money supply. It ramped up to 12% per year, and then it gradually tailed off to about 10% per year. But once we got to the end of the bubble period, you can see that the money supply increase fell very dramatically. So the question is, if you have massive fiscal stimulus, massive monetary stimulus, in theory that should have led to a massive bout of inflation. But if we actually look at what happened to CPI inflation, that's the Japanese Consumer Price Index, in fact there was mild deflation if we look in 1987, and inflation remained very muted through this entire period. And if we look at domestic wholesale prices, the deflation was more severe, and the inflation was much more muted. So where did all this money go? Well, you've probably guessed it, it went into the equity market, and it went into land. So while we didn't see inflation in the CPI basket, we saw massive inflation of equity prices and in land prices. So here in the bottom panel, you can see the effect on land prices in Tokyo. The annual increase in land prices was around 70%. And if we look outside Tokyo, the peak came a little bit later and lasted longer. Now, if you look at house prices in the US, for example, and you look at equity prices in the US, there are some very clear analogies with what we saw in Japan in the late 80s. We're not seeing a very big pickup in CPI inflation if we look at the consumer price index, but what we have seen is a massive inflation in asset prices in the equity market, and we're starting to see it in the real estate market as well. In fact, if we look at the size of the Japanese stock market in 1989, it was worth in total around $4 trillion. That was almost as big as the US, which was worth $5 trillion. And as a proportion of global equity markets, Japan made up about 44%. And if we compare that with today, Japan makes up only about 6.7%.
And if we look at the total value of all the land in Japan, it was worth about $20 trillion in 1991. But if we add up the value of all the land in the United States, it was only worth $4 trillion. And if we compare that with global wealth at the time, global wealth was roughly $100 trillion. And global equity was worth only $10 trillion. And not that you could sell it, but if you could have sold the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo, which is quite a small plot of land, it would have been worth as much as the entire state of California. So let's just step back and summarise what's going on here. The central fear of policymakers was something called an Endaka recession, which was the kind of recession Japan had seen previously when its currency strengthened. And because of the Plaza Accord, the yen did strengthen. But what happened was that the Japanese government and the central bank overreacted to that risk. It turned out that the impact on the Japanese economy just wasn't that bad. But the size of the firepower which they deployed in their stimulus programs was too big for what was required. And at the same time, they implemented many types of deregulation in the banking system, but also in the financial system, which led to problems later on. And the fundamental problem was this positive feedback loop which was created because as stock prices and land prices increased, that in turn led to an expansion of the money supply and of the availability of credit. And the combined effect of those two increases was to overheat the economy, which then fed back to rising equity prices, land prices, and the availability of credit. And ultimately, it was interest rates which popped this bubble. So this dashed red line that you can see here marks the very top of the equity bubble. And that happened at the beginning of 1990. And again, you can see that it's not a coincidence that by that time, the central bank, the Bank of Japan, had been raising interest rates. And in fact, it was only halfway through its interest rate rises. It started the tightening cycle at an interest rate of about 2.5% and it ended it at 6%. And at some point, when the economy starts to improve, the Federal Reserve will also start to raise interest rates. Not many of us remember a period when that happened, but it will happen because the economy will improve and it won't be appropriate to have such an accommodative stance from the central bank. Finally, let's look at the aftermath of this bubble. The initial problem was a banking crisis, and that was because a lot of the credit was collateralised with the assets which had lost value. So when you make a loan and the borrower can't repay it, it's called a non-performing loan. And if we look at the level of non-performing loans from 1992 onwards, you can see that it increases dramatically, from under 2 trillion yen in 1992 to around 13 trillion yen in 1995. Inevitably, this led to the failure of some banks, and of course other banks weren't as willing to extend credit to companies or to individuals. And that withdrawal of credit from the economy eventually led to a recession. And according to these estimates from Hoshi and Cash Yap's paper in 2011, around a third of Japanese companies were zombies between the years 1995 and 2001. Now that's a problem for the economy because if you have a zombie company, it's not productive. And if you don't have a productive company, it's not going to contribute to GDP. So the problem with this asset bubble is that it resulted in a misallocation of capital. Companies which shouldn't have received capital did, and productivity suffered as a result. And I think what's really worrying about this is how long that crisis has left a shadow in Japan's economy. So this is GDP rebased to 100 in 1980 for the US, Japan and the European Union. And while Japan did very well, overtaking the other two between 1980 and 1990, you can see that since then there's been a structural break. And it's been growing much more slowly ever since that bubble popped in 1990. Now what's kind of interesting is that if you look at GDP per capita, so that's the amount of goods and services produced per person in Japan, it doesn't look anywhere near as bad. And in fact Japan is now neck and neck with the US and the EU. And the reason for that discrepancy is a demographic one. The people who contribute most to GDP are the ones who are out there working, so people between the ages of 20 and 64. But if you look at Japan, over the last two decades, the size of the working population has shrunk by over 10%. That's much worse than any of the other countries in the G7. And what's kind of worrying is that Germany isn't far behind. Because of course, GDP is the productivity per person multiplied by the number of people. So if your population is shrinking, particularly the working population, then you better be more productive. And Japan's quite notable in the sense that it doesn't have any immigration at all. And that's a very quick way to increase the size of your working population. So I think there are some really interesting analogies there. 
Of course, they're not perfect. And the key one, I think, is that Japan's bubble was a political one. What we've seen in the US, for example, is a technological bubble. And that tends to be more productive because you're plowing money into companies which are very innovative. And many of the tech companies which we've seen created have been very innovative and very productive. But I think the analogy with inflation is an interesting one. We haven't seen inflation in developed markets despite the massive money printing and the combination of fiscal policy and monetary policy, just as we didn't see it in Japan. Where we have seen inflation surface is in asset prices, with a very strong equity rally globally and also a housing market which is starting to heat up globally. So if you do find these topics interesting, why not sign up for our free weekly market roundup? We try to pack it with interesting but concise stories about the economy, but also about investing and how the two interact. And it's very easy to do. There'll be a link in the description below me and a link beside me so that you can sign up for that. It's completely free and it's delivered once a week. And as always, thank you for listening.